<laughs> he did it right this time. Okay. Oh, he did it right. Okay. So I can speak. Yeah. All right. Welcome to Sugar, Silk, and Stretch, an exceptionally unique and different view on today's boxing scene. My name is Michael Silk Olajide. And I'm Gary Stretch. And tonight it's just Stretch and Silk. Yes, it is. And we are sugar free tonight. And long I, can... I, I wonder how long it takes before he comes on because he's addicted. You know that? <laughs> he's, he has a sugar addiction. You're right. He will not, he will not leave us alone. He, he can't do it. He think because he's the anchor. And he, he he will he will be on at some point. He will. Not I think. Be I think. Did you mean to say? Did you mean to say he's the anger? You he's the anger he's anchor. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the anchor of really anger. Don't know because I want to ask you something. Speaking of Ben's, he has he has an epic temper. So, do you know who this is? I do. That's a mini Ben par parliamentary Ben. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and we call. Him, oh, sorry. Hold on. Yo, Yosemite Sam, and he has this. He has an epic temper, as you said, and and uh, parliamentary Ben. I think we're gonna have to call him that from now on. Because he, oh, you know, he gets that smoke coming out of his ears, just like this guy, and he puts people only in with you, though, no, mostly with you. <laughs> I have no reason. I don't. I get. That, I mean, I'm speechless. I don't know why he always takes it. Uh, takes uh, why he gets angry at me. I mean, you're just he as. Seems, um, he, no, he, seems to think, he seems to think that you beat at your own drum. Oh, I beat my. Aren't we supposed to do that? Well, we are. We like individuality. But when you when you do the your usual silk smooth charm, he gets very angry and um, and uh, and has rage fits of rage. <laughs> well, speaking of making it, do you, how do you like my Elvis Presley jailhouse rock look kind of thing? It's beautiful. Don't <laughs> let Ben see it. Steal it, you know. <laughs> I wouldn't get that out of Ben, that's for sure. Okay. Still no, moving yeah. I'd like to see Ben in that jacket. <laughs> the only way Ben would wear them jackets is if he gets locked up. <laughs> like he's really wearing the bars for real. Yeah. That's funny. Well, we have to talk to him about this experience. But let me speaking of Ben's legendary, legendary anger. Do you anger easy? I am a flash. Um I get angry quick and I recover quick. And you recover quick. Like and I don't so all, it... I don't bear grudges. I, like if I got a problem with okay, you, I let yeah. you know and then I'm over it. I don't yeah. I don't I don't hold on to things. I try not to. That's good. That's that's extremely important. How did that play a part in your did your temper ever play a part in your fight career? No. Never got angry in the ring. Never. And I had fights where there were really, you know, dirty fights, but people biting me in the but and never be, for some reason it was the um, it was like automatic, you know. You just go when you're yeah. boxing, it's like an automatic thing, you know what I mean. And the anger has never been part of that for me. Mm -hmm. uh, I've never never felt angry, or I've never well, even felt like yeah. Yeah, I was going to ask you. So what's the what's the what's the one thing a fight has done to you that's made you angry? Like, what are some of the the things that have happened to you in the ring that would have made you hang angry? I'll tell you, not. Um, Jimmy Tibbs gave me the greatest compliment ever when I fought the Sergeant Tinian. He kept biting me and bodying me, and I ended up with a bunch of stitches. And uh, and he said, "You know, you never complained." And and uh, I remember, um, I, I never complained because I, I just thought that's, it's a, it's a fight. But I remember watching it after, thinking that's disgusting. That, like, why is the ref not doing anything? And I was angry after the fight, but during the fight, I was on automatic. I just you know kept yeah. fighting. I didn't think about it. But but um, I. I was I was angry at, at, at the fight with Eubanks. If you watch the fight with Eubanks, he he ducks low about twenty times and he hits me with his shoulder in the solar plexus about ten times, like really really hard. Yeah. And the, the, about the ten time he did it, as he hit me, I kind of I bent down on top of him because he hit me so hard in the stomach, and his head was there, and I kind of pushed his head, and they took a point from me. And that and if you watch the fight, as they take the point. Uh huh. I, I, I turn around to start fighting again and he hits me with the right hand. And it yeah. was like, I wonder if they hadn't took the point out of the fight would have gone. And when I watched the fight after, I was like, that's that's not cool. Number one, it should never have had a point. Yeah. And number two, 
I was completely unready to start boxing when I got hit. And it was like, yeah. I was pissed off about that. But it's, you know, what can you do? It's, it's over and gone. So, so let me ask you something about that, about that, about that fight then. Because I know often it's time, it's hard as a boxer to get over that. Have you ever, have you ever, like, have you released all the emotions and all the physicality that went into that fight? Have you released it? Are you, are you done with it? Or do you think a part of it still lives within you? I still have regret. I haven't, I haven't put it to yeah, bed. Face it, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I tried so hard, but I still have regret. And I still think, you know, it's about self-worth. And, and if I would have, having not had the time to prepare properly, if I would have held, my, held onto my guns and said, I pull out, I think they would have put it on again because it sold out. Mm -hmm. But I was so... Oh, yeah. I was thinking I won't get another chance, and I should have yeah. should have had more faith in myself. And yes. So I took it because I thought I'm not going to get another chance, and yeah. I probably would have got another chance. Yeah. So, well, that's I, definitely up to your management to do that. Yes, but uh, they didn't, and I don't think they. I think they were just looking again, like everybody else, for a fast buck. Yeah. Well, I mean, you were obviously a marquee. You were a name. You drew, you drew interest. You had interest not only of the boxing community, but especially outside the boxing community. And so that that opportunity is always going to be there for you. And and management would have to be pretty non exceptional in order not to notice that. Yeah, it was new. It was new management. They had no real stakes in the game. And mm -hmm. I think it was a they were getting a, a good chunk of change for the first fight. Yeah. You know, imagine taking yeah. over someone who's fighting for a world title first mm -hmm. fight. You didn't have to go yeah. and work hard and do all the little fights and, and earn the way. It was just straight mm -hmm. in first fight world title. They were wow. just thinking ching to ching. And so yeah. though, I think I think nobody looks out yeah. for me like it should. And looking and they're looking to do favors for the promoters as well. You know what I mean? The promoters like this fight still gotta go on, and these guys are new, they're still kind of I mean, they may be exceptional in other areas of business, but in the boxing world, if you're wet behind the ears, boy, they're going to take you to the cleaners. Yeah, they were completely wet behind the ears. And, you know, and, and in fact, the Eubanks fight, like it's totally it never got paid. Well, wow. oh, I, I mean, know. yeah. And, and, and so, so that regret right there, knowing that you physically, I mean, emotionally, you couldn't give 100%. Physically, uh, you had uh, some issues going into the fight as well. Yeah, I just wasn't in the shape I wanted to be in, and um, yeah, and so you know, Michael, if you're not in the shape, that then transfers to mental because you're not, you don't, yeah. you're not 100 percent confident. So it's yeah. it's yeah. everything is on the is on a slide minor because it starts with physical. If you're not physically right, you're not mentally right. If you're not mentally right, you you it's an uphill battle though. I mean, you yeah. know how hard it is when you're completely yeah. ready. It's still yeah. a challenge, but when you have doubt, it's it's not a good place to be in. And then I had other things before the fight. I was, there was still trying to work out where the money's gone and who's taking, you know, there's all this confusion. Mm -hmm. It was just the worst way to prep for a fight. Every possible thing that was supposed to be taken care on, of. Yeah. Nothing taken of. So yeah. I was going into yeah. something with so much uncertainty. It was not ideal, but looking back, I was a kid and I, I wasn't a kid. I was twenties, but late twenties, but I was like, yeah, I was uh, my own experience because I never I used to trust everybody, and that was my yeah. problem. Yes, yes, yes. You really do believe that everyone has it good for you. They have their intent is good, and even if their intent is good, but they're not experienced in yeah. what they're tr in what they're trying to do. If they're unexperienced in the boxing game, inexperienced, sorry, in the boxing game, that's going to lead you, uh, you know, to tragedy. It's not going to necessarily lead you to victory. Yeah, I think management, part of a good manager is to handle everything and let the fighter be peaceful and just focus on what he needs to do. And mm -hmm. I was I was trying to do everything myself. I even had people come from my home, a bunch of guys and on a bus, and I was trying to find them hotels, and everywhere was sold yeah. out. <laughs> I spent the day babysitting everybody and paying yeah. for the rooms. I was paying for everybody's room. People didn't have money for rooms. Wow. And I was like... Yeah. It was like a whole nightmare of the day, you know. It was like when, mm -hmm. when, I, when I got beat and it was all over, I was almost relieved. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know? And was was everybody with you, like the same people that came in after the fight, were they supportive of you or is it the usual? I left you know, alone with my dad. See what? I left the venue alone. No, really? But my family only. 
Yeah. 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 And, and no, um, no, I mean, you're Gary stretch. There must've been a Philly here or there somewhere along a little Philly, um, feminine, a, a lady friend, not I, even that. I've, I've, um, I've had a lot of punches. I can't quite remember <laughs> which one it was. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. No, so, I so, had a few friends and a few, but no, it was you know it was. I did, to be honest, Michael, I didn't want to be around anybody, you know, that yeah. night, mm -hmm. and for quite some time after, it was kind of you know. Yeah. You take know, me. Yeah. You do you remember when? Okay, so let's take it back if we can do a little past life regression kind of thing. Well, you were in you're in a ring and you had just lost the fight. Do you recall any of that emotion? At that Just, point, yes, the massive disappointment, and it all happened so fast. And it was very, it was very, it was out of control because I, I got this point taken against me. I didn't have a clue what I'd done. I mm -hmm. so I didn't do anything. He hit me. If you watch it, he hits me with his shoulder in the mm -hmm. solar plexus. And if you watch the round and the round before, about six, seven times, and you hear it bang, bang, you know, like he should have had a point taken against him. I get hit again, bang, with this elbow shoulder in my gut and he hits me so hard and his head's in my stomach and I kind of put my hand to move his head or and mm -hmm. he kind of falls forward or off balance and the ref grabs me takes a point I'm looking at the ref like what the fuck happened and then he mm -hmm. and then I, I just remember him signaling like to box and as I turn around Eubanks was on me so it was like from from complete organization for the fight this instant turned into chaos and as i turned the shot came in and everything happened fast i went through the ropes i was trying to climb back in the ring and mm -hmm. they counted me out outside the ring by the time i got in the ring he was on like seven eight mm -hmm. I, was not, I, I think i don't know the rules i'm sure i'm supposed to be in the ring when he counts but I was clambering into the ring. As I got in, he went like seven, eight, and waved it off. And I was like, I was, mm -hmm. I, 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 I was trying to get in. It, was, it wasn't that I couldn't get up. I couldn't get in. Yeah. I was kind of hanging on one rope. My ass was yeah. through the ropes, and I'm kind of my weight's falling backwards, and I'm struggling to get in. As I get in, he count counts me out. So it was like the fight seemed quite organized, and then it was a thirty seconds of mayhem, and it was over. So. I didn't, I was like, what the fuck happened? You know, what just happened? Like, it's over. And I, I know I got hit with a decent shot. Yes, 100%. And I, and I was hurt a little, but I was fine. You know, it was nothing like it was. Yeah. But, but it just happened so fast. And after the fight, I just kept trying to put through my mind, what happened? How did that happen so fast? You know? Mm -hmm. um, and then when I watched it, it I was angry because it's like, why are you taking the point off me? What have I done? Mm -hmm. Um mm -hmm. And then it was like, it all happened so fast after. So I felt like it got snatched away from me. Not, not Eubanks' fault. He just did what he did. And he had, you know, yeah, he, yeah, he's he's it. But the referee yeah. did, I thought, was at fault. And mm -hmm. it just all, it all ended so fast. And it was like years of looking forward to this moment. It just got mm -hmm. away. Yeah. It yeah. wasn't, I wasn't, I would rather have been beat well and live with it. No problem. <laughs> But mm -hmm. my anger, frustration was like, what happened? It was like I was, I, there was no resolvement in it. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So to this day, it, may, it remains unresolved because it was such a. I guess I mean it was an unusual ending. It doesn't. It wasn't a clear, decisive defeat. No, it was, it very, was a convoluted, very good. A convoluted defeat. If you look at from from the point, which is first point of like, there's a lot of. Uh, Opinions like every all my guys were all saying, "What a joke!" What a, you know, everybody. Um, from that point to going out of the ring to trying to get back in the ring, there was issues on that. Then where the count started, everything was debatable. So, um, and I'm in the middle of it all. It's all happening so fast. I'm trying to get in. I'm trying to get <clears> up. And, and and then next thing I know, it's off. And it's like, what just happened? Mm -hmm. And um, and and then it was going over in my mind, thinking, what could I, what could I have done different? And, and I know for a fact, if you see when he hits me in the stomach, and it look, I don't know if it looks like a pushing, but he's he's got his head in my groin. Mm. Now, if someone's <laughs> head's in someone's groin, I think you're allowed to move it, right? Yeah, yeah. 
You know what I mean? I'm not like I push him and pull him down. He just on me. reflex. Just on reflex. Yeah, just reflex. And they took a point for that. I told you he's here. Oh no, you <laughs> let he came and left. Anger. Mm -hmm. He probably felt the anger and had to go and take a cold shower. He probably thinks <laughs> we've done this without telling him. <laughs> he thinks we've hid the link from him this weekend. He'll have a whole he'll have a whole monologue when he comes on. Why have you come on without me? Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. So so I so wonder who he attacks first, you or me. Yeah, I know. I don't know what's gonna happen, but it's gonna be fun. I know that. We have to make sure we record it for everybody. Um, so so you're at what point are you after the fight just by yourself? Um is there any point? Pretty, pretty pretty soon after. I it's funny, I had a very long moment in the changing room alone. Uh -huh. I got rid of everybody. Yeah. I thought my dad had gone, but mm -hmm. uh I, I just said everyone's gotta get out. I, I was just I was sat in silence and it was I remember it was dark, in fact. I must have been there a while. I heard someone sweeping up, like mm -hmm. outside in the corridor. And my dad had a wispy chest. He had a, he had a condition where you, you could hear him breathe sometimes. When okay. I was a little boy, I used to I used to go and sit near him, and it was like it was like the ocean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Um, so his discomfort, in some ways, was like a comfort to me. I'd fall asleep listening, and he'd wake up and he'd see me next to him, and he'd move because he was very like non-touching. My dad, man's man, never give mm -hmm. me a hug. He's very like, yeah. you know, stay over there, boy. And um, so I'd sneak up to him and I'd fall asleep with this little wispy chest. And so I got rid of everyone and I'm sat in the darkness in this little room on my own and I hear, mm -hmm. and I, uh, uh, that's my dad. And then I said, yeah. dad? And he says, yes, son. And he's behind the door outside waiting for me in the corridor. He must have been there an hour on his own. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What are you doing? He said, I'm waiting for you, son. And I said, I opened the door and he come in. Mm -hmm. He's never said I love you in his life to anybody. Mm -hmm. That's just wow. he, he doesn't say that shit. Yeah. And he sat down next to me and and he said, You know, you was born in the house. I said, What? He said, You was born in the house. Strange story to tell me at this. I said, Really? He said, Yeah. He said, You was early. He said, I was out buying a carry cot for your mother. And I came home and there's an ambulance and the nurse at the door. And I said, what's going on? And she said, he's upstairs. And he was a week early. He said, I ran up. And he said, I had oily hands because he was a plumber, dirty hands. Mm -hmm. And he said, mm -hmm. they put you in a chest of drawers in a little blanket in the chest of drawers. They didn't have a carry cord. Yes. And he said, mm -hmm. I, I wiped my hands and I picked up this little white blanket with my oily claws. He used to call them the claws. He had big hands. He was strong with that. Yeah. He yeah. said, I bit you up with the claws. And he said, you were very dark. You were darker than the other two, my two older mm -hmm. brothers. And mm -hmm. he said, you know, son, when I looked at you, I said, I, I always knew he was going to be somebody. And mm -hmm. with that, I, I looked at him and a tear rolled down his cheek. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess a tear rolled. And he had, come on, son, let's go home. And I said, okay, dad. And we got up and we walked out. And I'll never mm -hmm. forget, there was a limousine waiting for me, a driver with the hired or whatever, and he sat there, and we were like an hour late or whatever for everyone that left the venue. And and I looked at the limousine, and there was a black cab with a light on. And I went and got in the cab. I said, "Fuck the limo." I don't know why I did that because the limo yeah. was paid for. I just said, yeah. "Fuck, that. I'm going to go home." And so me and my dad jumped to the cab, and we fucked off. Yeah. And the limo I was looking at me like, "What the fuck happened?" I went, "Yeah." And I, just, and I left. And one of the great things about my loss was I connected with my father for the first time. I was and, going to say that bonding moment must have been. And I wouldn't change that for the world. Yeah. So I might not have ever had it had I not got beat. So I, I have mixed feelings about um, the, the loss because at least I I got to yeah. share a really magic moment with my dad. And that was and the most sensitive, uh, that's the most sensitive time you've ever had, even post with your father. That was the you most. You know, so years later, I got. I went to drama school, and I and uh, it's funny. I, I was talking to the acting teacher. You know, you've got to learn to get in touch with your feelings and all this. And my life was you never talk about feelings and all that. Never cry. And I was raised men. You're know, men. So now I'm in drama school. You've got to get in touch. You've got to use your emotions. You've got to get in touch with what makes you tick. Mm -hmm. And I remember saying to the acting teacher, "You know, my fucking father's never told me love." me in his life and she said have you ever told him i said are you crazy 
and I caught myself being him. Isn't that wild? Right? Yeah. I said, why don't yeah. you go home and tell him? I said, I can't. She said, tell him you love him. So he, I was in America. He was in England. So I called him. And mm-hmm. we're talking on the phone about whatever. And about to hang up, and I said, I said, I love you, Dad. And he hung up on me. <laughs> wow. And uh, I remember running around the room in like a sweat thing. I can't believe I said it. I can't believe I said it. But it was weird. Yeah. And then the next time we spoke, I love you, Dad. Beat, put the phone down. The next time, I love you, Dad. Bit longer. And after about six months of drilling it down his head, what, I got the shock of my life. One day I said, I love you, Dad. He said, I love you, son. Wow. And I thought, I taught the fuck yeah. one. Thing. And so, why do you think, yeah. Gary, why do you think, do you know why you were... And then from that from on, that time on, he, he used to talk to me much yeah. more. Yeah. Why, why do you think he repressed those emotions and he wasn't able to say that to you first, even? I think I think it's generational, you know. I think... I think but did he have an experience? Now, did something happen to him? Do you know if something happened to him that would... I don't think that? he was raised with... I think he had... I don't think he was raised with a lot of... Uh, you know, may, we come from a small town Emotional. in the north, factories mm-hmm. and working class. I think I don't think he'd ever experienced it himself. So I, for yeah. him, it was normal not to say it. He didn't say it because he didn't want to. I don't think he ever thought about it. Yeah. And yeah. Um, and then when I said it the first time, I, th- I think he probably thought that's weird. You know, why are you telling me that? <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then I think yeah. he kind of worked it out over the time that it was important. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, and I thought maybe I taught him something, you know. Uh, yeah, people yeah, sometimes yeah. need they need to know, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. We yeah, sometimes. I think I, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I'm just saying. Sometimes, you know, I I tell people now. Um, oh, you know, I tell people who am I to tell people anything? But I I always try to say, you know, don't have if you tell people you love them, they they they, they need to hear sometimes. Because often mm-hmm. we don't feel it or we don't, you know, we all live in an insecure, insecure is part of being a human being. But it's nice if sometimes someone can give you a word of comfort or give you a support or mm-hmm. tell you you're valuable or, you know, mm-hmm. but we don't do it. We think we, I know my dad used to brag about me to everybody, but he never told me, yes. never said, I'm proud of you, son. Yes. You know, or, 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 no matter how many fights I won, he never said. He, he said he actually said it on the night with Eubanks. He said, "I'm I'm really proud of you because you're so brave." And and he said it because he knew I was not 100 percent. Like I, I had a little bit of flu, and um, yeah. and he wanted me to pull out. I got like a yeah. bit of like some virus like 24 hours before. Mm-hmm. You know, when you touch yourself and it hurts, like you're oh, yeah. aching. Mm-hmm. I had I said, it's a bit. I can't believe I'm fucking sick. And he's like. You can't. I said I can't pull out now. It's like no chance. So um, it, he thought I was very courageous, you know. So mm-hmm. I just thought I got it, and so it, it was very nice that a couple of things in the loss. Like my dad said a few good things to me, and it was more important than winning the fight, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, that kind of support increases. That increases our value in ourselves, right? And that's one yeah. of the things that. It's one of the most important I think half of my career, I think my whole boxing career stemmed from trying to prove myself in the beginning that I was, mm-hmm. I think when my mother left, my, I think I felt like, you know, abandoned kids, they think it's their fault or they've done something wrong mm-hmm. or they're not good enough. Or, so I, I've always been in... It's it. Um, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with insecurity as long as you use it in a positive. I used to get up in the morning. Yeah. I, do, I did the runs. I did. I, I was too insecure not to. You know, I didn't. I didn't think yeah. I was any ever any good. So yeah. you know, but I think it stemmed from my boxing, a bit of anger from my mother leaving, and then always trying to prove I'm worth something. You know, and uh, yeah, and I, I think it's it drove me in the beginning. So if if not your mother and your father. Who valued you? Who taught you about value in yourself? Or did you never really know that until you got into your second career of acting? I really didn't know it, to be honest, until I... I used to think now and again, like, you know, I used to I used to pull things off, like, a, you know, do things. And, wow, you pull that off, or you've done this. Or, I was a bit of an achiever, but it never really registered. And now and again, I used to think, 
I was okay. I, like, should pat yourself on the back. But I never really did. And then I met this older lady who was the teacher, and she was the one who kind of st- made me start to have value. And um, and that's what intrigued me about acting. It was not so much that I wanted to be an actor. I just wanted to learn. The- she once said to me, I won't teach you how to act. I'll teach you how to live your life. You know, that's and so... And that was that, and it was this, uh, it was being around someone with a different point of view than my father. He had a very ma- masculine point of view. Don't emote, don't this, don't be afraid. You know? And she was, it's okay, uh, you know, it's okay to cry. It takes a, a, a man to be open and to be vulnerable and to show mm-hmm. you, mm-hmm. to show you, you know, to be have a sensitivity. You know, all of the things that my dad never touched yes. on, she, yeah, she yeah. said it's yeah. Okay. Um, like my dad, you know, he was he was old school, hardcore old school man's man. How about yeah. you, Michael? What about no, what no, about no? I was going to ask because we're, we're we're on a very interesting road. I like this road we're on right now. So, was there a, between you and your acting teacher? Was there um, an attraction between you two? Did that? No, she was an, she was an old lady. Oh, but that's okay. You know, no, no, I, I don't mind. I don't mind. Uh, <laughs> I don't mind that. That's not the, that's not the issue. But she was an old lady, and she was a wise. She was more like a mother to me. Um, yes. And she, I think she. I, I don't know when I when I look back. You know, she died a couple of years ago. But when I look back, I mm. think she was so s- smart. You know, she worked with all the great yeah. actors, and so, so a lot of these great actors, they're really smart people. Like if you look at the Pacinos, that they're very fucking yeah. smart. And yes. uh, for her to be teaching them, she must have been a genius, you know what I mean? So um, I think she met me and and felt that I needed her in some way. I don't think she planned on saying he's going to be a movie. I think mm-hmm. she thought, you should hang yeah. around for me. She once said to me, why you should hang around? Come sit in a class or two. It's a bit of fun. And she mm-hmm. never said come be an actor she said come and and, and i sat and i used to watch yeah. and it was like an experience it was a it was like uh knowledge and um i was i got hooked on the knowledge learning yeah. stuff every day and having mm-hmm. a different point of view and and um and i think she she knew i needed that it's like the child needed yeah. to catch up to the men yeah Yes. And, and isn't it, Gary, isn't that exactly how your trainer should be? Like that's the kind of, every fighter needs that kind of trainer, a trainer that's inquisitive about them and pushing them and developing them and, and not even maybe sometimes not even pushing, but leading them the right direction or even answer, asking them a question that you're going to have to answer yourself. You know, what's funny, uh, Michael, uh, mm-hmm. like I think you would be an amazing coach because you would, openly talk about stuff to your fighters you know what i mean i think i would i would say i wouldn't say like i would get into it i'd say it's okay if you're afraid what and, yeah. you know i said it's okay and i would deal and we you've got to fear. use it you know i think i would emote with them i would talk to them i would yes. let them but if you look at it and it's definitely a a, 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 a like your when me and you were doing it it was a different mindset it's changed mm-hmm. a lot in the last 20 years. Yes. Like, like now you can't, you know, the women's uh, movement and, and equality and, and uh, all of this stuff, which should have been there always, but it, it wasn't. And, and it was a different, it was a different, like my trainer, I remember when I was a kid, he was like my dad, he was very old school, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, I can tell was afraid uh i think as as times have changed and now where you're at you've evolved so much as yeah. a human mm-hmm. uh i think you would be an amazing trainer but if, if you look back in like was your trainer a kind of guy who would talk about everything or not yeah absolutely not i mean my father was my first trainer and i didn't talk to him about anything outside of boxing we really didn't have that conversation and Hector Roca, who is an excellent, amazing trainer and very knowledgeable and taught me a lot of stuff that really helped me get to my next level. Um, he was, we didn't, like we bonded, like we were, we were like, emo, like we had a, um, like a really good emotional, intellectual, I wouldn't even say that kind of bond. 
Angela Dundee, we, we, we bonded in a different way, but it wasn't like to the point where we would trust and, and I would talk to him about things that personally going on in my mind and vice versa. It was more or less like it was an, an arrangement, like an arranged yeah. marriage. <laughs> yeah. yeah, with me and my train, it was like, you know, I wouldn't dare tell him I was afraid. Yeah. You know, think of someone, mm -hmm. he would say, what's wrong with you? Like, you, yeah. you're in the wrong game, son. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't be yeah. human. But now I think if I had a kid who was, if I was training a kid now, I'd say, I was afraid it's part of being human. Everyone's insecure. It's part of being human. It's like yeah. people have put such uh, shame on human feelings. and We all have them. Mm -hmm. You don't need yeah. to hide them. Yeah. It's like yeah. if I'm afraid, it's no big deal. I'm still going to fight you. I'm still going to give you everything exactly. I've got. You're going to have to kill me to beat me. But uh, I, yeah. I'm not afraid to say I'm afraid. Yeah. I'm afraid. Yeah, you know, and, use the, and use the fear as fuel. That's every, yeah. it's every single emotion that we feel, right? Every single emotion that we feel, we can use it as fuel or we can get that, that feeling destroy us in the ring. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I think it's, I think it's highly uh, advantageous to listen to your body, listen to your yes. mind. Mm -hmm. You know, and then and then and instead of denying it, listen. You say, okay, what am I afraid of? Okay, and then mm -hmm. work it out. I'm not afraid really yeah. to yeah. get hurt. I yeah. I worked it out. I worked it out over 20 mm -hmm. years after I retired. What was what was mm -hmm. that? With every fight I had, I was always af af afraid the next fight. I never I never got over it. Mm -hmm. And I used to think, what am I afraid of? I didn't know. But years later. Yeah. I was afraid it's the unknown. That's why you never get used to it. You never mm -hmm. know what's going to happen. And there's something scary about that. You yeah. know, when you don't know what's going to happen, it's an uncomfortable, you know, you yeah. can't, you, you can prepare, but once the bell rings, it's moment to moment, everything's out the window. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you have no, you have a degree of control, but then there's my control. Then, 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 then there's him. So he mm -hmm. has got it. So yeah, yeah, the fighter has a say in it as well. Your opponent. Yes, yeah, so like, there's right. no there's, there's no guarantee. So you you never know what's going to happen. So it's that's a scary thing. Uh, uh, so it took me a long time. I was afraid of the unknown, which which is which is okay. It's normal, and uh, and I never let it cripple me. I tried to use yeah. it, in, and the adrenaline was useful. And yeah, but yeah. Um, because it I, switched off, I guess when you started fighting. That that fear switched off and it became. You don't have time like, for it, do you, Michael? You don't have time don't to be too busy. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Got shit to do it. I can't think about you know if you start thinking you're dead. So yeah. you just gotta yeah. the fight goes off we go and and you do what you're prepared to do and you've done it. It's like it's like a million drills. Mm -hmm. you no, know, we go on automatic. We've done yeah. rounds and rounds of fights in our life spa and it's like mm -hmm. we just get off we go like riding yeah, a bike. Yeah, you hope all that kicks in. Yeah. And that's why it's so hard if you've never seen it before. Like if your if your trainer hasn't shown you, uh, like you can train for somebody to get to get ready for a fight. You can get in shape, and there's just general fight conditioning. And everyone's talking about running, and everyone's talking about pull ups, and everyone's talking about all the other stuff. But then there's the intricacies of getting ready for somebody, and that's what trainers have to know. That's where they make their money. That's where they're they're worth their salt when the trainer can actually say this is what he does so this is what we're going to have to do every day in order to take advantage of that how many of those kind of trainers did you have do you have anyone that was really like like a brain like a whiz that would that would say this is his these are his idiosyncrasies these are his habits and this is how we're going to take advantage of them or was it just the general get in shape do what you do and we're going to win mostly that yeah. i was the one who used to i, I was the one who used to um, I used to get tape if I could, you know, um, and I used to, I used to pretty much work it out myself. Um, mm -hmm. I remember with, with George Collins when I, in the amateurs, the big fight that I won, I, I looked at him and, uh, he used to catch shots all the time with his hands, you know, he used to mm -hmm. do. So I thought this is crazy. Uh, like if you, I was very fast. So when I fought him, I, I threw half speed to let him catch because he wouldn't mm -hmm. have caught me at my speed. So I allowed him to catch and I threw one, he caught it. I threw when he caught it. Then I threw a feint and he caught he, <laughs> he went, and he left himself wide open and hit me in a right yeah. hook. It was good night. But I saw it nice. in my mind before mm -hmm. I, yes. I said, and I, and I consciously threw half speed to let him catch. False mm -hmm. and secure, let him catch. Jab, catch, jab, catch, yeah. jab, catch. Yeah. Boom, and he, boom, crack, yeah. good night. And then, so I <laughs> That's amazing. 
Yeah, I planned it clearly. And I said to my brother, I see it. Yeah, yeah, I said to my brother, it's, it's going to last a round. It's going to last as long as I want it. I'm going to throw, when I throw the shot, it's going to hit him because he's going to walk into the, I'm going to lead him into this false sense of security. Thinks he can catch me, thinks I'm not so fast. Mm -hmm. And he was catching and catching. I threw the little thing and boom, good night, count to 100. And uh, I planned it. But I used to, and then when I fought Eubanks, I, I, I watched his strengths and what were he was strong, and I tried to stay out of them situations with him. Um, I kept moving a certain movement, and he kept having to reset. He kept reset. It's like what Leonard did with Hagler. He kept the foot mm -hmm. on the outside. He Hagler mm -hmm. to reset and reset. And so mm -hmm. he, people thought, you know, it, it, it was not that it, he could never live with Hagler in a fight, but he kept making Hagler reset. Readjust readjust yes. you know and of course everybody's uh, got different feelings who won it who didn't and it doesn't matter but what saved Leonard from getting fucking killed is yeah. that ability to make Hagler keep resetting mm -hmm. and not get yeah. into his Hagler rhythm which if he did exactly. he knew it was an early bath you know and that was the strength of footwork right that was the strength of Beautiful like one footwork. using his instincts and his intelligence but definitely his footwork and, and that's what they always say now Hagler was more than a puncher but you want to keep guys who punch hard turning and and they say you want to keep them turning because once they get a sense chance to put roots into the ground it's like it's good night if they hit you yeah and, and, and what it, leonard did with Hagler, he wasn't so much what leonard did himself it's what he prevented Hagler from doing because yes. if he'd have let Hagler be Hagler, he would have got eaten alive Mm -hmm. And I think he knew how to just nullify to some degree. And again, it was yeah. such a close fight, and some people had Hagler winning still. But I, I just, yeah. I applaud Leonard for the fact that I think anybody else at that time in with Hagler, Hagler would have he destroyed everybody. Oh, yeah, the fact yeah. that he could destroy Leonard is such a lot of points for Leonard that he could go the distance, even you know, mm -hmm. five years out the ring, and to survive with Hagler. I know I probably mm -hmm. wouldn't survive with Hagler. There's I, a million I know others that, with him. Um, yeah, no, I think um, I think Quincy Taylor could take partial credit for that as he dropped Ray in training, right. <laughs> and Ray ch and Ray changed his uh, his fight strategy after that. Um, I think it was a couple of weeks before their fight. Uh, before their fight, Quincy Taylor, a young middleweight, who ended up winning the WBC. I believe it was the WBC title, and um, really strong, good southpaw, really good fighter. And um and and he dropped Ray pretty pretty ugly in in training and and Ray I guess he dusted himself off got himself together and over the net last two weeks changed up his fight plan and said he's not going to stand there with Hagler anymore so he was going in with a different plan Quincy really? changed it and and he that's a huge effect he made on the ripple of a uh, boxing for sure. For sure. I love Leonard. I love what he did. I, I, I'm one of the few, uh, well, a lot of people thought he won it. A lot of people thought yeah. he didn't. Yeah, I think I gave it. yeah. but I, 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 I gave it to Leonard myself. Which yeah. everyone was too crazy. It's just that I love what he did. It's like Mayweather. Yeah. People don't like, I love watching Mayweather. I like when Mayweather makes people miss, I really yeah. appreciate it. Some people say yeah. he's boring. I think it's amazing, you know? Yes. I think that whenever you come across it, I look at boxing differently than where I used to before I boxed. For instance, I thought it was more or less just instinctual, primitive urge for guys to slug each other. And then when I got in there and I see that, you know, and I competed myself, it's like it's instant. It's like adapt or die. That is boxing. You get in the yeah. ring, a certain guy's doing something you're not ready for, he's stronger than you anticipated, faster, all these other things. And if you don't adapt, quick enough that's it it's like you know what i mean it's it's, it's over you're going to get hurt you're going to get knocked out you're going to lose i think and that's so, what makes the great fight is the ability to adjust yes which is what what my only downfall for the heavyweight um daniel dubois i think yeah. he's a really good solid pro big puncher mm -hmm. if he's got a plan he's great <clears throat> but if it changes he can adapt and that's his downfall yes. i think yeah. Otherwise, it'd be I think more... that happens because he's not so experienced, right? Like he probably hasn't Maybe. seen a lot, and he's programmed by his corner. <laughs> you yeah, know? you tell him what to do and send him out; he'll do it. But if it exactly. changes, he doesn't adapt well. And I think Mayweather was the greatest adapter, as was yeah. Ray and 
I mean, yeah. all of the great fighters. And one thing they all have in common is an exceptional international amateur careers, like an extensive amateur career. Those are the kind of guys that can adapt the best because they've seen them various styles and have had to do different things in, in um, getting ready to fight those guys. Yeah, yeah. And I think Ray, when he watched Hagler, was not so much what he could do to beat him, but I think he watched what he could do to negate his strengths as much as he could. Take mm -hmm. Hagler's strengths away from him if he could. Yeah. And so people could say it was a defensive fight or it was, the, it, was, it was a survival fight for Leonard yeah. in the first case. But it was one how can I stop he, Hagler being Hagler, you know? Well, one of the things he did, which was uh, he took a page out of like the um, – he didn't do what was expected of him, which was to always keep moving to his left. Like everyone says, you got to move to the left with the southpaw. Oh, you got to throw your right hand, the straight right hand with the southpaw. And he was using the left hook. He was hitting with body shots. He'd stay there, throw combinations, and then step off before Hagley had a chance to come back. And this was, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't, um, it wasn't base, it wasn't southpaw one hundred and one. It was, you know, what I, I mean? think like, also. Kind of I think also I remember thinking a, a big dis disadvantage to Hagler was Hagler came out orthodox. Oh yeah, for I, the first three, four rounds. You know yeah. what I mean? I thought, why if like if you're one percent better at southpaw, be a southpaw. Yeah. Why give him yeah. anything? You know? Yes, exactly. And um, I, like I, I, there's a lot of switch hitters, great, but but yeah. it, I think if you're yeah. 10% better fighters as Southpaw, then stay Southpaw. Yeah. Why give him I, I almost think like I almost think like Hagler kind of out strategized himself. Like the the three of them with the good with the Petronelli brothers, they put a strategy together. They say, We're gonna we're gonna surprise Ray. We're gonna come out. He's expecting us to come out Southpaw. We're gonna come out orthodox for the first. But I mean, Ray has fought a, a million and one orthodox fighters. He's proven to have trouble with southpaw fighters from Ayub Kalule and I, I don't know who else, but that's from what I, Hector Camacho, even though that was before the Camacho fight, they had moved together before then. And and so it's it's really interesting that that um, Hector would choose that plan of attack. I'm laughing. But, I've got Ben here with a comment. Hector switched in every fight. Yes, but he didn't come out orthodox for five rounds, Ben. Um, yeah. He switched, he, he, but he fought. I think the biggest thing that Leonard worked against Hagler, and I think it worked, was he worked on his ego, and mm -hmm. and so and Marvin was emotionally involved rather than just Marvin wanted to de, de he wanted to strip mm -hmm. Leonard of everything. He he wanted to he wanted to humiliate Ray, beat mm -hmm. him. He, he got rather than just Hagler used to go in and just win, just destroy people. With Leonard, I think he took it personal, and I think it may have affected him slightly that he he was slightly emotionally involved. He really had to win this fight, and he and I think he maybe tried too hard, or if he'd just been the usual Marvin Hagler, he'd have just probably wore Ray down and got yeah. to it, whatever. But he tried to kind of. Do a well, number those, of them. Yeah, well, those are all the attributes that you know what I mean. You either you either master those those um, instincts that that come up within you, uh, or or you don't, and all those things dictate to how whether you're going to win or not. Like I, I don't buy it when you know when um, when Hagler says, "Well, it's because of this, 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 this is why I lost." Okay, so you understood that you understood that now. You probably should have understood it. You know yourself well enough before these kind of like barriers should have been put up and in place. Um, like I think, you know, you as, a, as a fighter is to be open, is to be open and accepting of things. So then you can change them. If, otherwise you're not going to change anything if you're not open. Yeah. And you know, Mike, it's like you see a lot of great fighters in not, not all great careers, but you've seen some amazing fighters who spar and beat everybody up in the gym and then they can't do it in the fights, right? Yes, yeah. The absolutely. only thing that is is mental, right? Yes. Someone mm -hmm. changes. Mm -hmm. And so it's not that they're less a fighter, they're the same guy, but something, when the fight comes on, they overthink it or they get some kind of pressure on themselves and then if it was in the gym, they'd, they'd beat you. But when yeah. the, so the mental aspect is so important. And I think that when the stakes are high and you have to win, you start making mistakes and you start doing things you wouldn't do. Whereas in the gym, you just go on automatic mm -hmm. and and you let things come to you and you deal, you know, but when on the pressure of a fight, it's when the stakes are raised, people can make mistakes because it's, yeah. uh, 
It's, it's, it's really time. hard to turn a fight around when you're doing bad. It's, but people don't understand how hard that really is because you're getting corrected. Every time you're making a mistake, not only are you getting hit and you're losing points, you're getting hit and you're feeling pain. And pain is the one thing that very few, few human, human beings can get over. In fact, none of them do. It's like we learn through pain. We change things because, you know what I mean, because we felt the pain of loss or the physical pain, you know, that, that our nerves or broken bone, whatever it is, concussions, you feel pain, so you change. So the, the fact that I think that's very um, – it's an amazing thing about human beings, like that fighters that can do that mid pain, make a change and end up winning. That's one of the most incredible, incredible. things. Yeah. And, uh, and I think that, you know, you more than anyone, that's why I like listening to you when you talk about boxing is because you discuss the mental side of it, which is a lot of people don't. And it's such a big thing. And it's, can you control that mind? Can you in, yes. in, in massive amounts of pressure, are you going to let this run away with you or can you control it and change, like yeah. you say, under yeah. pressure, knowing that you yeah. can't continue doing the same? It's like, you know, yeah. you repeat something five times and think it's going to be different. It's not. Yeah. You've got to change. Yeah. Have you yeah. learned in the middle of a fight? When you've prepared a certain way and it's gone a different way, can you adjust? And yeah. that, that's what separates, I think, yeah. the greats from good fighters to the greats. Yeah. They have the ability yeah. to, quit, to yeah. change. It's Yes, it's the complex thinking, and they have complex instincts. Like I know that sometimes I was just like, uh, in a lot of ways, I was just very rudimentary, extremely basic in what I did. And then um, you know, I, you know, my dad would be in my corner, and he goes, "Hit him with the jab," and I'm like, "Well, I'm trying to hit him with the jab, but every time I throw the jab at him, he has an answer for it, and so I have to shut down and not throw the jab because I know that I'm going to run into something. You know what I mean? Because he's he's ready for that." So now I have to go to part two, and I don't understand what that is. And that's that communication between your corner man. Like, how do I get to, how do I get to like second base safely without getting tagged? You know what I mean? That's those are some of the things that some that trainers kind of have to do in order to, um, you know, to help their fighters. You know, except where they're at, get to the next stage, get safely to, you know, and turn turn a losing effort into a win. Let me ask you, Michael, you train now a lot of regular people, right? You would not fight. Yeah, I, I train more people for fitness, and I train one one kid right now for a fight. So let me ask you, do you use the fighter-trainer mentality with regular people to teach them to find an edge or to find a to, oh, to, yeah. to push themselves further? Yeah. Because they're, yeah, they're, with a fighter, it's normal, but with the regular people, it's foreign to them, right? How, yeah. how do you get switch their mind to the fighter mode? Yeah, I think generally when they come to work with me, they're they're working with me for exactly that anyway. That's why they're coming to me because I I, I think when someone meets me, they on come level, to you to fix their minds as much as their bodies. Um, I think I think they're looking for like a really high level of fitness, and in looking for that high level of fitness, they know that it's beyond just the physical. It's you know there has to be like I, I talk to people like. Listen, when a person fights, you know this. Um, you, when you look at a fighter, you all, you see his personality. We've talked about it before. And so you see the shortcomings and you see the strengths, you see the weaknesses, you see all that. So you, you try to complement that. You try to, you know, get them to perform higher in an area that they're not necessarily comfortable with. And, and it all attaches, the physical all attaches to the emotional and, and so when they feel a sense of accomplishment, when they are able to finally do something, even if it's physical that they couldn't do before, they were able to endurance wise push back, push past a certain point where they were. That's a win for them. That's, that's, you know, okay, now you're, you know, five and one or 10 and oh, you know well, what I mean? And you're, you're talking to really, on those terms as you would a fighter. Your clients must, be, it must be really rewarding for them too. Cause most trainers, in mm -hmm. these, you know, bodybuilding trainers and general health trainers, mm -hmm. not fight. Like, you come from a different world. It must yeah. be such a victory for them when they start to win little battles in their mind, which people yeah. don't deal with normally in regular yeah. training. They just go through yeah. the exercises. And, but when you talk on the mental of the and how the mental changes the physical, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah. I oh, never yeah. forget Arnold, Arnold Schwarzenegger said to me when he used to train arms, he used to he used to literally say, "Grow arms, grow." He would talk yeah. to his body like it's so. <laughs> but he said he used yeah. to will himself to grow mentally. Yeah, 
And it's like, I, I sort of think he's crazy, but I sort of think about, it. no, he's not. He's yeah, like, no. he says you will it to grow and it will grow. Like, yeah, talk. no, absolutely. Yeah. And that, and that he's, he's more or less like hypnotizing himself. Right. He's, yes. He's, yes. You know, through that, through repetition, he's, uh, I mean, that's not only his initial thought, it's just secondary. It's the rudimentary. It's, it's the stuff, you know, behind the, in the universe. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and putting it in your, like into your, I mean, it's just so prominent in your mindscape. And that's one of the things. That's, so now you start living your everyday life in order to affect that change. Like everything you do in your life is to affect that change. And so it will happen if that's what you want. That's absolutely what's going to happen. People, uh, they should understand the power of the mind like that. But um, let you me ask something else, Gary, real quick, because I know we don't have much more you. time. I had so many questions for you. I want to ask you, have you ever broken any of boxing's taboos? Is on the lighter side. What's a taboo, in your opinion? <laughs> Give me um, have you had uh, uh, copious amounts of sex with women prior to your fight? Like within, a, let's say, within two weeks of a fight? No. I was pretty Never. strict. Wow. No, no. So you were disciplined pretty, like that, huh? I was, dis I was disciplined that way. Um, I remember one situation but i was told to do it which is right. interesting i was getting ready for a fight and uh freddie roach was training me uh -huh. and um and i peaked too early about 10 days before i was knocking everyone out i was in amazing shape right and me and freddie used to go in the mall every saturday and get an ice cream mm -hmm. if i was on weight that was and watch a movie, maybe. That was my day, right? We trained Saturday morning, driving to Vegas, because I lived outside of Vegas in a little tiny shithole. There's nothing there. There's just a prison in my apartment, a place called Gene. It was like a Burr Bonds apartment. And, and I would be out there and then every once a week I'd drive into Vegas, watch a show, maybe on a I would train Saturday, watch a show, have an ice cream, Sunday off. I'm back in the gym Monday, Monday through Saturday. So I'd met this girl with Freddie in the mall, beautiful girl. And we had this real kind of connection. I really, and I was only young and she was young. And, um, but I couldn't take her on a date because I was in training for a fight. So, mm -hmm. and, but we really kind of like, but I was shy too as well. Believe it or not, I was mm -hmm. quite, I wasn't, you know, she knew nothing about my life. Mm -hmm. So and yeah, I never told her. So, yeah. yeah so, um, anyway, Freddie says to me after training, like 10 days out, he said, do you think you'd take that girl out tonight? I said, what? what are you talking about? Like, he's great. Do you think you'd take her out? I said, I don't know. I don't know if you'd go out with me. You're like, we'd only ever talked a little bit in the store. I said, maybe. He said, think you can fuck her. I said, what? <laughs> 10 days out? I said, are you crazy? I don't know. He said, well, yeah. he said, look, I want you to go in, take her out for a meal, have a glass of wine, one. And if you can, get a bit of action. <laughs> <laughs> and what was his, what was, why? <laughs> to this. So he said, if you can, he said, then have a good night. And but one glass of wine. If you can have a bit of fun, have a bit of fun. Mm -hmm. Have Sunday off. It was yeah. Saturday night. And I see you in the gym Monday morning. I said, mm -hmm. And he gave me 50 bucks. He used to give me no money, so I couldn't go off anyway. You know, I couldn't <laughs> buy chocolate. I'd be walking around, no money, nothing. Can't buy yeah. food. So I went in. We went out. We had three bottles of wine. <laughs> Not a glass. We had a night of nights mm -hmm. till the early wee hours. And it was yeah. like, a, it was like absolutely insane. Yeah. The next day I couldn't fucking, I was dead. Uh -huh. And I went in the gym Monday morning. Still, it was a day later. I still felt bad, and I was terrible. Uh -huh. And the next Tuesday I was a bit better. Wednesday a bit better. Thursday on the money. Friday buzzing. Saturday Sunday off fight. Uh, you know, I can't remember that. It was maybe ten days before, so it was a Wednesday, so Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So by the time the fight I was on the money again, and it, and he pulled me back and because I peaked too early. Genius how he did it, and. Yeah. Um, well, uh, let me ask you. Let me ask something before you jump off that subject. 
how much would you give to go back to that moment, that moment in time, like where you were training with Freddie and you had met this girl? Like, is that moment, does it have like, the, is it romantic? Is it, is it sexy to you? Do you want that? Would you? You know what I, there's many yeah. things. I, you know, there's an innocence, which is both of us were innocent. Like it was like, yeah, she was a beautiful person. And, and I was a nice kid, you know, we, and we, yeah. And yeah. we and we'd had a long kind of courtship, and we both really wanted to see each other. We couldn't, and she was like a really cool girl because she understood that you know she knew I was training. She didn't know much about me, but she I said I'm an athlete and trained. I may have told her a fighter, so she was like a few times she, she had some events and she didn't tell me. And then later she said, hey, you know, I did this event, but I didn't tell you because I didn't want you to want to go and you can't and she was very kind you know she was yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. We finally got together we were really both wanted to be together it was fun it, yeah. was, it was romantic it was innocent you know too yeah yeah i love it so it was nice but um and what's interesting about it what is what, the thing when, you, when i understand when you said you miss it and could you go back what's beautiful about it michael is it's because as a fighter like you know we can't do certain things. So you appreciate even the food, you know, um, like, like I miss tasting food when you're hungry, you know, like the flavors are so much better when you're starving on a diet. It's like, oh, yeah. you can't yeah. how good it is. So I miss silly things like food, how, how amazing, you know, when you, I used to dream in the, I, I this is how crazy the mind is. When I was trying to make weight, I would, dream about banana milkshakes and then i'd do the weigh-in and then i had no interest in uh, after, after, <laughs> when i could have one, one one it's like the yeah, yeah. Life is <laughs> but yeah. I do, I, it is a great feeling when you can when you've been dieting for a long time then you the flavor of the food and the like you you the little things that we don't appreciate anymore um you really appreciate when when they're taken from you or you can't have them so i miss a lot of things that I take for granted today, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. it's nice to really enjoy something when yeah. you have restrained from it for so long. Yeah. And it's and, certainly and so, really so finally, if, if so, fi if you can go back to one time in your life, fight career or not, and and what, and in fact, not just one time in your life, the moment, like a moment, whether it was a fight, whether it was, um, well, whether it was a fight, whether it was a relationship, whether it was whatever it is, what one specific moment in time with your father, with your mother, brothers, what specific time would that be and why? There's so many things I would change. Mm -hmm. um, and would that help you boxing-wise? Those changes? No, no, they, they, they would have, it would have hindered. Okay. So I lost a lot of relationships. I lost a lot of things because I put boxing first. Mm -hmm. And I have regret sometimes because, you know, it's like uh, I had a, I, I remember when I was at school, I was in love with the girl my whole school life, like from 11 mm -hmm. to 16 when I left. Yeah. And, and I wanted to marry this girl, but I, I, I wasn't in a position. I was, I, I had nothing I, I I wouldn't let and she had to go to school and I and like she had to go with me and let her go through the struggles I was going through because yeah. you know I wanted better for her so mm -hmm. like you know you give up a lot and and then I met people along the way which I probably could have had interesting situations or relationships and I couldn't because I, I put boxing first so I often wonder because I met some fantastic people and incredible situations even business people saying come here we have this business and i remember a friend of mine was setting up this this insurance business and we wanted me to get involved and i couldn't i was too busy and they sold out years later for hundreds of millions you know what i mean wow, yeah and, and, uh, <laughs> I have like a third of what yeah but there's yeah. a lot of things but but you can have everything right yeah uh, but would i would i change you know i, I I don't know. I, I, of course, I would like to have done better in my life and been a better person in my life. You, there's always better. I, I today, if you ask me in a year, I probably want to change things I'm doing today. But mm -hmm. it's an evolution. But, but boxing did take away a lot of things from me as much as it gave me. 
Mm -hmm. It gave a lot, but it also took a lot. And, and you can't get the time back. You know, when I turned pro, I left my family and my brothers and I left my father and I left and I was months and years away from everybody. You know, and it was a, uh, it, it, you know, you give up that time. When I lost my father a few years ago, I thought, how many years I was not around him? Uh, um, mm. So, you know, you give up a lot of things for, for the quest for yourself and you think to yourself, oh, was I yeah. selfish? You have yeah. to be selfish, you yeah. know. And, and the thing is, what what you do have to realize, which makes it easier for you to live with, is that the people who love you, mm -hmm. they want you to give it up because they know how much important the boxing is. They want you to to to. They know that that's your journey. So this is part of the things that you have to give mm -hmm. up, mm -hmm. and they support it. So that makes it better. Like my dad. There would be if I would have not left my family and and don't chase my dreams, I would have had regret. I would have had mm -hmm. resentment. You can't live that. So you've got to follow your dreams. And and any dream uh, or anything that you have to strive for, you're gonna take casualties along the way. You can't please everyone. And you, you. you know, at the end of the day, you have to live with yourself. And if you resent, if you regret because you resent, then. That's not a good place to be. So I have given a lot up in my life for many things, and I've I don't regret because it was my journey. But I have also, when I look back and reflect, uh, I lost a lot of time with a lot of people that I love that that I cannot never get back. I love that. That's almost like we're tying this thing up in a nice in a pretty bow. <laughs> that was really good. Thanks for your honesty and thank you for being the uh, subject of questions. I, I always oh, find like I always find um, fighters' lives, you, you know, the, as predictable as it may sound, because you know you train, you fight, and it seems like everyone has the same experiences. Like I'm getting into this with you right now, and I, and I just find it like it's so interesting me to, to go inside and see what really makes you tick. And, and of course you're always identifying you like, how does that relate to how I was feeling when Let I Let me ask you one question, Michael, do yes, you sir. going back the question you just asked me, was there any specific thing you would have changed at a moment that you, did you have excessive uh, mm -hmm. sex for a fight? Did you do something that was against <laughs> Or, or was the, or was the relationship you lost because of the fights? Was, was there any regret in the in the journey you took? Did you leave yeah. any prisoners behind, or, yeah. or, or, or possibilities of beautiful things that could have happened that you walked away yeah. from? I, I think you can't. I mean, this is coming from somebody who didn't reach that goal. You know what I mean? So, so yeah, there, there absolutely has to be regret if you put everything into it that you. I mean, I can think of so many ways that I, re I regret doing things. I think you did reach the goal, though. I don't think you need a certain award for the for the height you reached. When you share the ring with one of the greatest fighters in history and, and share moments when it's back and forth and exciting and are in one of the great fights with probably the most dangerous fighter in the history of the sport and you rocking him in the ninth round and... And 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 traded at the highest level. I don't think. I think that is the success of your. Like, I don't think you could afford a lesser man, which everyone's doing today, and got a belt. And I still think I would rather your career fight Tommy Hearns than beating <laughs> some British champion in a in a in a manipulated WBC rating and getting a world mm -hmm. title fight. I I I I cherish your career. And yeah. the risk you took, and the so I, I, I disagree on that. But mm -hmm. back to the question: Was there any regrets that you think you walked away from and 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 lost out on, or what was the price of boxing for you? Yeah, so, in any I, I mean, yeah. I mean, I think I think the you know there's the physical size of it, the eye injuries, the balance issues from getting hit, you know, behind the head. There's, there's always the physical thing and that's something you deal with and you try to keep yourself, you know, in tip top shape because as you know, as you get older and you move less, these things make themselves a lot more, you know, a lot bigger in your life. They play a major part. I, th I think the, my major disappointments, I mean, I remember, I remember 
you know, when, you know, there are times between my father and I that were very good. They were terrible. And I remember after my first loss, um, being approached by an extremely, like one of the top boxing managements in the, in the sport at that point. And it was after my Tate fight. And he was like, you know, I really, I'm really, I'm sorry for your loss. I think you could really do better. And you know what, if you, if you want, uh, I, I'm here for you. And I think I can make you world champ and blah, blah, blah. Here's my card. Get a hold of me. All the rest of that kind of stuff. And, and I, and I, and I didn't, <laughs> you know what I mean? Because my, my, obviously my dedication, my loyalty was to my father. And sometimes I've, and it's, it's an ongoing theme throughout my career and throughout my life. In fact, I, I always end up not putting myself first. And, and I think it's a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a curse, but it's also a blessing. And, and, and you, but it's it's something a little bit. I don't think we have enough time to go into it, and it's it's a it's a complex thing, and it's and it's my own thing. It's my nature. It's something that goes on inside my head, and for some reason, when I do something, people react to me that certain way, only because of the way I come out, because of the way they perceive me, or the my actions and 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 my mannerisms and what I do. It's all answered by that. So, yeah, there there's been times where I absolutely thought. You know what? Um, I wish I would have taken a left when I took a right, but ultimately, I'm also happy where I'm at right now. And you know, you know what's funny? Lately, like Sean B just said a very nice thing about me. He said I should be proud of my career and blah blah blah. And I, mm -hmm. I appreciate it very much. What I love about this podcast, as much as we we have some amazing people who watch, you know, because they're educated. Yeah. A lot of them, they ask great questions. They. Mm -hmm. I'm very happy that we have such a, you know, maybe a small audience, but it's an educated, cool audience, you know? And so that makes me happy that I do it. But but um, I lately, have, uh, you know, people people always say to me, you've achieved so much. And I, and I, I said, well, you know, okay. But I yeah, I often wonder when, if, if I die, and, mm -hmm. and let's say there's a few people around my coffin, uh, what are they going to say? Like, I don't think it matters if you're a good actor, been in a good movie or a good boy. I, I, I would like them to say, you know, he was a great person and, and I loved him. And he did, he, he helped me one day with this. Or like, mm -hmm. I often say to myself, what have you done? What, what are you leaving behind? You know? Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think it's when you say you always took a second place or put people first, I think that's amazing because they know. And, that's a bigger award for me than any fucking belt or for movies. Like, mm -hmm. If you can affect one person's life and be and and make it better, then then your time here was worth it. You know, mm -hmm. it's like I've always felt okay. So you, I'm boxing, and that's for me, and I'm doing this, that's for me. And but like, what are you doing for other people? And so I I try as much as I can to yeah. see every day how can I help someone a little bit. Uh, you know, and and it and I get so much joy when I see someone. Mm -hmm. If I can yeah. be a part yeah. of help a little bit, it's so much better than saying. Yeah. I'm not good at taking gifts, but I love giving people things. You know, we yeah. have to learn yeah. to receive. It's a gift to receive because if someone yeah. if someone gives you something, it means something. It, yeah. You know, it, it's yeah. wrong not to fully accept it. You know, and, exactly. and I have a hard time get receiving things, but but um. More and more, I think I have to learn to accept. It's like uh, they say, when you can love yourself, you can love anyone. When you yeah. can live with yourself, you can live with anyone. Yeah. Until it's, then, it's that sense of worth, right? It's like that's yeah. so important that it has to be implemented. It has to be implemented by your parents early. And just Danny actually uh, just made a quote. I uh, just left a quote for us, uh, left an answer. And he said that, well, it's a Canadian thing. And, you know, <laughs> And I tend to think he's right. And then Canadian, it's a, you know, Canada is part of the British Commonwealth. So we get some of that too, right? So you said here, Canadians generally take bad fights and wrong journeys. 
Duet O'Sullivan, Ruddock, Lalonde, many, many more. And, you know, I guess I'll be in that crew right there. <laughs> I don't think so. I think, I think we could list a few English. <laughs> yeah. But again, like Canada being we'll be the uh, Commonwealth, right? Part of the Commonwealth. So it's, yeah, yeah, uh, I mean, it's, it's all, we're all related. It's like, I think it's it spreads crazy. all over everywhere. So, yeah. Anyway, yeah. Silk, it's been a pleasure. Um, my answers can only be as good as your questions, my brother. Oh man! Well, thank you so much. Yeah, I, hey, listen, I'm honored to just talk to you. Well, when you know what I mean, I really enjoy your company. I enjoy your personality, your fight perspective, your talent. You know what I mean? Your honesty, your realness. It's all. It's all good with me. I and it, and it, thank it you takes so much. Time. So I, I guess, am I going to do our disappearing act as well? I, this is the point where I say, you know, this was a more like sanguine and, uh, you know, more sensitive. Sure ben, you know, I, I would have lost the bet. I thought, Ben, I bet Ben, Ben, I know you're watching. Why don't you come on and close the show <laughs> as the anchor? <laughs> I, well, this, I was going to say, this has been, you know, like the you won't let you close it. You let you close stretch. We'll be back again <laughs> with more and probably more uh, an emotion. Oh, yeah. He won't let you close. You won't let him close. I will let him close. You asked me to come on. <laughs> I, want you to I was going to say it would be a more emotionless diatribe on, you know, but you know you then you know what we're going to do? We're going to okay. have silk close and then you close on the close. Go on in. Oh, I, I already did my close. I said do it one more word. time because I butted I it. used a big word. I don't want to use a big word again. It's like my well, five dollars. So do word. a nice close and then Ben will close on your close. <laughs> okay. Oh, let me see. Um, I miss you, Ben. This show. Uh, let me see if I can do this. Okay. So I don't think the show missed me at all. I think it was great. I mean, I think you know it didn't miss me at well, all. We miss your oh, rage. Right. No, we definitely miss you, Ben. We absolutely missed you. Yeah. No, no that was that was good. It was long overdue. It was a good job, guys. And I think that people liked it. You know, that's, uh, that's all I care much. about. I don't have to be all over everything. We love you, Ben, and it always is a, a gap without you. But on that note. You can close, and then Ben can close on your close. Okay. Um, Come on, he wants this to happen. Again, yeah, again, this is a more sensitive episode of Sugar, Silk, and Stretch. We'll be back again with more emotionless diatribe next week. More fight he, stuff, right? He was trying to sound like me then. Listen, on a serious note, that was good. You know, proud of the two of you. When you're not involved and, and vying to have your opinion heard, you look back and look at your two good friends. It's talking a lot of sense and a lot of moving emotional um important content and you're proud to be a part of it i was i was happy i didn't mean to invade earlier on i was trying to put the clip of gary's fight with you bank in there at a certain point oh. in context but it pushed me into the studio and then i just jumped straight back out again because that was your oh. moment and you guys smashed it you know you smashed it so yeah. look, thanks for tuning in i agree with what gary said i reiterate what gary said that we have a small but a very cool decent intelligent audience and you know we wouldn't want it any other way we'll be back on friday we're going to keep going until I guess we're looking for something that we haven't found yet with this money, mostly, right? But but we're going to keep going. Well done, well done to Michael and Gary because that was, as Gary Richards said there, it was a great podcast, guys. And, and, th and thank you, thank you, Gary. And voice, the the prior message from Voice was a very nice one. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, really was. McDonough. That's Peter McDonough. You know that. Well, I, I appreciate it, and I appreciate all the listeners. And uh, Michael's like, who the fuck's Peter McDonough? I'll tell you later. Tell you back <laughs> I tip that don't swear. You know, this, I'm not one to cuss. All right. We had to get that in because because I was on the show. We didn't have a profanity, but we got one. So we can close now. All right. Let's go. <laughs> Yosemite Sam. Let's go.